Welcome to another episode of Talking with WIT, Kevin and Son. Hi, I'm your co-host, Kevin McLemore, and I'm joined with that go-to guy, Ife. And we're bringing you something very, very, very special. This episode is brought to you by RMK Productions and the 10 United Podcast Network. Our mission is through the power of story to uplift, inspire, share experiences and perspectives using the framework of teaching, learning, and modeling. Our show is all about the people you should know and hope, helping other people every day. Now, the question has always been presented to me. I'm a three-time published author, and people always says, I wish I could write a book. And then people don't understand the, the business of how to write a book and, and what the business is. So I've asked a very special friend, very talented friend, Miss Judy Pinnell, to join us today to share with us and tell us about the magic behind the words. Let me give you a little uh, insight just before we let her on, because I want to make sure if you've ever just, uh, thought about writing a book, I want you to keep this in mind. Our guest is an award-winning, best-selling uh, Amazon author. She, uh, I mean, come tell you, she writes books that are flirty and fun and serious. Um, she's also um, a voiceover person. She was a voice of my book, Sprinkles, The True Spirit of Christmas. And she's also my personal editor of my last book, Dating with a Full Deck, and probably the next couple of books. Um, I, I did, just want you to write this down, uh, formatting for youcom That's how you reach her. And I want to welcome our guest, Miss Judy. How you doing? Hi there. Thank you so much for having me. No, thank you for coming. There's so much um, about you that I don't know, because I know everyone doesn't wake up in the morning with a pen and paper in the hand that says, well, when I grow up, I'm going to be an editor of books. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be an author. I'm going to be a audible um, voiceover um, person. So um, if I can peel back the layers of your, your life a little bit, mm -hmm. um, where did you start out? How were you a, 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 as a kid? You're probably a straight A student, right? I was a straight A student. Um, and everybody always asked, you know, when did you know you want to be a writer? I have the very first story I ever wrote, which was in first grade on that big yellow paper that had like drawing space and then the lines. I still have that story. So um, it started then in third grade. I got an honorable mention in the Caldecott Award. Um, and just, you know, when you when you're a writer, you write. I never had, you know, I never thought I could be a published author because to me, that was those people. They, they had the secret sauce or knew somebody or whatever, but I was always writing and, um, you know, life happened and intervened. And then, um, Princess Diana died and that actually started, um, I wrote a story. I wrote an alternate reality. It has not seen the light of day and it won't, but it opened the floodgates amid, you know, raising my children and having a house and a, you know, marriage and all that stuff. But that story, that event triggered me to write. It was like my coping mechanism with her death because I was a huge Diana fan. And then, um, and then I got an idea for a time travel that takes place at the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair. And that was my first book that once I finished it, I said, what do I do with this? And I found the local chapter of Romance Writers of America, which is the Valley Forge Romance Writers. And I joined them. And that's where writing took off for me. Because then I saw, I mean, I walked into that meeting and the first person I met was a published author. And she was published with Harlequin, which of course, you know, at the time was like the dream publisher. And, um, and I fangirled all over her. And then I found out there were other published authors. And it was like, oh my gosh, this is something I could do. Now, this was in the days before Kindle and before, you know, real self-publishing. There was the whole vanity press, which is a whole part of the market we can talk about. But, um, but once I joined Valley Forge Romance Writers, I ended up going to conferences. I networked. I met agents and editors. There's an, a or an editor at Harlequin. We joke. We were both baby people at the same time. She was a baby editor. I was a baby writer. I've submitted to her numerous times, and she's actually taken a couple to acquisitions for me, but they shot them down. So I keep saying to her, Stace, one day I'm going to work with you at Harlequin. Um, but, you know, networking and learning the business of writing, and that's really 
you know, the, the one-offs where people write a book and it becomes a bestseller, they're very rare. Now you hear about them because they've become a bestseller and they go wild, but to really have a career, you have to know the business of writing. And that's what going to Romance Writers of America national conferences did for me. And, uh, and then once I became published, I was eligible to join other groups. So like this fall, I'm going to Florida to um, the Novelists Inc. conference where I feel like a baby, a, a baby writer again, because all of these people have, you know, astronomical careers in writing. And I'm just, you know, learning from all of them. All right. So tell, tell us a little bit about your first book. I'm just curious to know. So which the first published book? The first published book. Okay. The first published book is called In Over Her Head. And it is a direct twist on The Little Mermaid. It was published by Sourcebooks, which has been acquired by Penguin Random House. Um, I sold, I was the first person, Sourcebooks was getting into the romance industry. So they were coming to all the conferences and whatever, but I was the first author that they bought a series from. So they bought a three book series. The first book was finished. It had been through um, two big online contests, I think. I, there, at the time, there was, um, it was called the First Chapters Contest. And before that was a, t- a contest called American Title. So some of my books had been entered into those and I got a lot of publicity from, from the American Title Contest, which was run by Dorchester Publishing and um, Romantic Times Magazine, which is now not in existence, but at the time it was the magazine of the romance industry for readers go in and they would get you know, reviews and upcoming releases and all the advertising and stuff. So they ran a contest like American Idol and they called it American Title and there were 10 finalists and we had to get people to vote and we called it boot, um, marketing boot camp because none of us had a published book, the 10 finalists, but we had to get people to vote for us and to vote online. And this was in 2006. So we didn't have TikTok and I think Twitter That's might have true. just become a thing, you know, so it was, um, so I got a lot of publicity for my book, Beauty and the Best, which then when I got eliminated from that contest, somebody contacted me and said, Simon and Schuster is running a contest for all fiction. So I joined on the last day I could. They hadn't structured it. They weren't expecting 2,700 entries and they got 2,700. They were expecting like 300. So the way it was structured was a little cumbersome. So coming in on the end and especially a romance, um, I got a ton of attention and my book finished in the top 20 and it was the only romance um, we were written up in the New York Times so I can be like yay my name's in the New York Times um, and then I didn't win that but what happened was it generated such conversation on the site that it was called gather.com again not in existence anymore but gather and Simon & Schuster saw the hoopla around romance and so the next version that they did was first chapters romance so i entered a different book which was in over her head i finished third um the final the final judges were um it was pocket was the division i think two pocket editors and um a woman who was the national book buyer of romance for borders books and so i met her at a conference i went up and i introduced myself and when I came in third, Pocket bought numbers one and number two. And so I went up to her and I introduced myself and she, it was the best reaction. She was like, oh, I loved your book. And she's going on and on and on. And I'm standing there shocked. I mean, she loved my book. And she goes, do you want to know why you didn't win? And I was like, yeah, because she loved it. And she, my merman at the time. So in over her head is about merman at the Jersey shore. Mm-hmm. And, and it was a twist. She was the human and he was the mer person. So anyway, my merman had a tail as mermen do. And she said, if you can get rid of his tail, you'll sell this book. I said, I can get rid of his tail. I had no idea how I was going to get rid of his tail, but I was going to get rid of his tail. And when I said that to her, she immediately went around to um, a lot of the editors at the conference and pitched my book. And it ended up going to a bidding war. I had an agent at the time and it went to a bidding war and source books won and they bought three books in the series. So one was written and the other two weren't. So, so, so you get, you got paid and then you got prepaid. Yes. 
Yes, but I'll tell you that prepayment, that was scary. That was really scary because now I had to deliver. You know, when I wrote in over her head, I was writing it for me. My friends laughed at me. I mean, it is a total um, pun, plays on words. Like, have you ever seen the movie Shrek? Yep. Okay, kids are laughing down here. Parents are laughing up here because there's a whole other level of funny that the kids don't get. And that's kind of like how I write. Like, this is funny, but if you really get my wordplay, this is really funny. Um, So I forget where I was going with that. So, oh, so anyway, when I sold the book, they had the book and then they had the proposal for the next two books. So that was three chapters and a synopsis. So they bought it. So I wrote that book. That's book two based on the three chapters I'd given her. Well, when I turned Mm -hmm. it in, she came back and she said, I hate your heroine. And I was like, what? She goes, you need to rewrite the book. You need to change her completely. And I was like, how how do I do that? And I had a very, very tight production schedule because they wanted to release these books so quickly. So she told me right before Thanksgiving, the book was due January 3rd. I started it 24 times. And yeah, exactly. I'm like, I don't know how to do this. And it wasn't until December 14th where I changed my heroine's name and I was able to write a new book, new heroine. So, and I turned the book in a day early. So that was one of the worst Christmas vacations I've ever had. Yeah, you you know, it it surprises me when when I, uh, when I share stories with people and, and I tell them when you submit your work, you're the writer of a book and then you submit it to someone else that's going to publish your book or edit your book. And then they tell you how to write your book. Um, did I throw you for a 360? Cause I know the first time it happened to me, I was like, what? Well, it, what threw me was she had already read this character. I mean, it was three decent sized chapters. So what do you mean you hate her? Cause that's who she was. And I will tell you though, that my editor was hundred percent correct. That book went on to win a prism award, beating out a couple of USA today, bestselling authors. So as a matter of fact, I didn't even go to the ceremony. I had a choice of going to dinner with my publishers or going to the ceremony. And I was like, well, I'm not going to win. I'm going to dinner. And I came back and my friend goes, you won. She hands me my award. So I looked at my editor. I go, you were right. But you know, at that point, when we're a writer, we write our baby. Our story is our baby. We've created it. We nurture it. You know, we edit it to make it better, but then we give it to somebody. And the minute we give it to somebody with the hopes of getting paid or to see it on a shelf, at that point, it becomes a product. It's no longer a baby. It's no longer our baby because now, especially when you do traditional publishing, you know, the editor has to get paid. The copy editor has to get paid. The cover artist, the marketing people, it goes all the way up. Like when I say, um, Stacy took my book to acquisitions at Harlequin, you know, I got in the door. I got through the editor. Then it has to go up the chain. Marketing has to look at it. How can we sell this? What's our return on investment going to be? And then it goes up to the higher ups. So it's not just like Stacy can say, oh, I love your book. Let's print it. Mm-mm. It's got to go through the, the financial end of it because it, and in the end, it is a product. And that's what I always tell my editorial clients is, you know, the first step is you gave it to somebody else. And my nickname in this industry is Bloody Judy as you well know, Kevin, because I bloody up a book and I bloody it up with good and the not so good, because I'll tell you, this is great. This line works. This had me laughing out loud. But then I'll also tell you, this character isn't working or this doesn't follow logic or this you know, doesn't fit here. But I do that because it's better to hear it from me than to hear it from readers. Because right. the minute a reader puts a bad review on Amazon, it's there forever. Amazon will not take out bad reviews, even if there's spoilers in the plot. I know people have tried and they're like, they said who did, who the murderer was. And Amazon will not take them down because they're so customer focused. So it's so much better to hear bad news from somebody who's on your side and wants the book to succeed than to put out you know, a bunch of junk and hear about it forever. Well, to my to my listeners, I just want to tell you, anyone that has ever has spoken to me about the book writing process, I have never addressed Judy Fennell as Bloody Judy. <laughs> I, I, would, I would say that, uh, and this is the way that I describe you, she will pull out the, the best in your characters. She will pull out 
the best in the story. She will tell you when you, you've had a home run and she will tell you when you need to go back and take another swing at it. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're sensitive. Um, so this isn't the industry for you. I was gonna say that, <laughs> you're, you're Dr. Wright, because you can't be sensitive. And um, when I first met Judy, I knew what I was going, going to get. And matter of fact, I, I got a good friend out of it because um, yeah. she, she, she is a gift. And my, my book, Dating with the Full Deck, I had to rewrite it so many times. I had to learn things so many times. And I thought I had something good. And I, I have to tell you, you, you made it that much better. You made it that Maybe much you better. did have something good. You absolutely, I kept telling you, you really have something with this. We just had to make it stronger. And that's yeah. what we did. Yep. Yeah. So I have one question. What, what, was, what was the hardest, and is this a two-part question, what was the hardest part about editing Kevin's book? And is there a funny story in this process before it, it, it went out for sale that people don't know about? See. All right, we're about to fire Ife. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, here, here's a good one. I don't remember. <laughs> to be honest with you, I, I honestly don't remember. I do, I've done how many edits since Kevin's book? Um, I just remember when we were doing, I, I kept saying he has something here. He really, it, it, it was delivered wonderfully. Um, his concept of the book was great. So, you know, edits are edits and everybody's going to get edits. So they were what they were. But the best part about working with Kevin was that he took them in the vein that I intended, which I always tell people, I've had some clients who, you know, are like, well, I should give up writing or you don't like this book. And it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm here to make the book stronger. And, but I always tell people too, your name is on the book, not mine. So my suggestions are based on my experience, my knowledge and my thoughts on the industry but in the end, it's your book and your name is on it. But you hired a, an editor for a reason. And it does me no good. And it does you no good to blow smoke up your skirt. Um, you know, so if you if you are in this industry to be in this industry, you have to understand how the industry works and reader feedback. You get one chance to make a good impression. And that happens, you know, in a lot of places in life. But but the Internet is forever. And so are Amazon reviews. So, you know, it behooves you to take advantage of hiring an expert. And, you know, I don't know at what point you want to talk about, you know, your mother is not the expert. Your best friend is not the expert. Um, your English teacher is not the expert. Your English teacher, you know, thank God for English teachers. I had great English teachers. I actually named one of my characters after my two favorite English teachers. And my male English teacher came to my book signing and read my book and loved it. And I said, I'm still not sure how I feel about my ninth grade English teacher reading my love scenes, but okay. Um, but English, editing in English class is way different than editing in fiction, nonfiction, anything commercial. Um, I mean, I use an instance for myself. When I write love scenes, I don't want my characters breathing, being able to take a breath. It should be, the tension should be so high and tight and they should be very involved in what they're doing that I don't put commas in where grammatically commas should go. I know where they go. I was a language major, um, but I don't want them there specifically. So it was a running joke with me and my copy editor at Sourcebooks. She'd be like, I just put commas in, but you're going to take them out, aren't you? I'm like, yep. I said, but I know you have to put them in because that was her job. But my job as the author, and there goes the sign. My job as the author was to make the book, my book, make my characters three-dimensional characters. And I said, I don't want my characters to lose the sexual tension. So they're not getting a chance to stop and take a breath. And therefore my readers don't either. And, and that's the, the nice thing about working with Judy because she gets she gets the author and she connected with with me at such so, such a level and she knew what um I was trying to bring and I wanted to do something different and I wanted people to feel the story instead of reading the story and um not all editors are Judy Fennell so I just want to let everyone know that um you have to get, get very lucky to, to, to be a client of, of Judy's. And with that said, Judy, can you share with people how they get in touch with you and, and tell us a little bit about your company? Sure. So the company name is www.formattingforwomen.com. 
for you.com. It's formatting the number four and the letter you.com. And I literally came up with that name in about three minutes because I had a brand new client and, you know, starting the business and that's another story, but I thought of Toys R Us. So it's formatting for you. You know, that's literally how I did. So the reason I came up with this business and it just started simply as formatting for digital and print. Um, I was an author. I was on an author chat loop and this was in the early days of Kindle 2011. So that's, you know, when Kindle came out and somebody was so excited. One of the authors wrote, I'm so excited. I found somebody who will um, lay out my, my novella in a PDF format for only $300. And I had a heart attack. So this was 11 years ago. $300 was worth a lot more than it is today. You know, today it's gas, but um, you know, 11 years ago, it was weeks of groceries, right? So I had a heart attack and I smart ass commented, I'll do it for 50. And that's literally, I didn't have company. I had just figured out how to do this whole thing for myself. And she didn't contact me, but somebody else did. She said, were you serious? I have two books. I said, yes, I'm serious. And that's how the company started because I'm tired of people's dreams being taken advantage of. There are so many users in this industry who will, oh, sure, I'll help you get that published. And then it's a you know horrible cover. It's not edited well. The technology doesn't work. Um, Kindle's... Kindle used to use a Mobi file, which is um, pretty much an archaic format now, but you had to get the, the coding right and take coding out. And so there was a lot of behind the scenes stuff. And since I started kind of at the beginning of the industry where there were growing pains, um, I've innovated a few things. Um, I was at a conference, the Charlottesville uh, Book Festival in Virginia one year and um, the author relations guy from Amazon, his name was John Fine at the time. He was giving a presentation in the same room where I was going to give a presentation right after it. And I've talked to John, but more as an author, like, and honestly, I didn't even know he knew who I was, but he's asking, you know, he's taking questions and people started asking him technical stuff about Kindle and Mobi files and how you lay this out. And he just went, I'm not the tech guy, but this lady right here is going to be giving a speech. And I was like, Oh my God, he knows who I am. I was like, can Amazon buy my business? But they haven't. (laughs) But, um, you know, there was a lot of technical stuff in the beginning and, and then a lot of people taking advantage. So that's kind of just how my business grew. I, word of mouth, the romance industry is hugely wired into the internet and especially back then. So when I started doing it, there weren't a lot of people doing it. So I never really had to advertise. Um, because I just get word of mouth clientele. Well, I, I found you through, and you came highly uh, rec- recommended, and I, I was very, I'm still very pleased. And uh, and much like you, um, I started my business because people were taking advantage of people yeah. that were doing podcasts. They were claiming to do things that they wouldn't do. They were complicating it, and they were just recycling what other people had already said and charging them for a premium. I do say that I wish I had met you when you were only charging 50 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did charge a little more than 50. She got 50, but that was it. After that, I learned it was a little. No, but, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to say, and you hear this uh, on a lot of different formats. You get what you pay for. Yeah. All right. I, yeah. I, so I have a client right now who I took a book. Well, I didn't take a book. They brought the book to me to be edited and they had already paid somebody a lot of money to edit the book and they left the comments in and the version I got they really were flat out wrong the comments that the previous editor had made so I did some research into her um let's just say I've been in the business and on this planet a lot longer than this other woman and the information she was giving was wrong in the industry so she may have been an editor with a reputable company, but her knowledge was not there. And you know, I felt bad, but I had to turn around and charge them a lot of money to edit the book. And I ended up, I mean, 
first of all, they brought me a book that was 115,000 words for fiction, which is wrong. Unless you're writing epic fantasy, it yeah. should, should not be anywhere near that. It should be this eh, 65 to 80,000 words. And how that editor could return that to them, it wouldn't, it wouldn't sell in the marketplace. So I got the book down to 80,000 words, which is where it should be. Way to go. Mm -hmm. um, audible book. Audible. All right. Yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Judy Fennell. She is the voice of Sprinkles, the true spirit with Christmas. Um, people always ask me, you know, why I did not read my own book. I'm going, why would I read the book when Judy can do it better? That book needed not your voice. I know. Your voice is great for other ones. But yeah. you're right. That was, that was definitely a better choice to go with somebody else. Now, when, when you read a book, when you, uh, I'm going to say when you edit a book, mm -hmm. do you read it for content or you read it to, for, for structure? Uh, what, what is the process? Because I don't, you know, you read a lot. Do you actually enjoy everything that you read or, or you, is this is just work? So for editing, editing is work, but I hope to enjoy it. Um, you know, there's books that I've edited that are not my personal taste or aren't something I'd ever pick up. Um, but if the author is a good writer, that makes all the difference. But there's a lot of times where it is, work and it's like okay i have to do this today um that was not the case with yours i enjoyed everything about yours thank um, god i'm sweating over here yeah no 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 um and and honestly i mean even like the people i'm like oh i have to do it it's usually because i have to put so much work into it there's a lot of education that i do um when, when somebody hires me to do a content edit or a story edit or a full edit which is what you and i've done i look at everything I look at content, I look at structure, I look at characterization, I look at plot, I look at marketability. Um, I look at world building. I look at all the issues of craft where we're talking grammar, spelling, punctuation, word usage, um, point of view, narration, dialogue, dialogue versus conversation. I mean, there's a, a plethora of things that I look at in a content edit. And when I do a copy edit, which is strictly spelling, grammar, punctuation, and word usage, it's different. Um, it may not take me as long to do a book. So I obviously I charge less for a copy edit, but I also have to bite my tongue because I'm still seeing the same issues that maybe they think are fine but that's not what they've hired me for. And in the past, I used to point things out and then I had somebody not very happy with me. And so I just was like, oh, well, I'm not gonna do that anymore. Um, but I did, like, I just got something from someone and I, I sent it back to her. I did my sample edit. An editor should always give you a free sample edit, whether it's a copy edit or a, well, for a content edit. Copy edit, not usually, but in this case I was doing it because she said she needed a copy edit, um, but there was some language barriers or issues. So I had to make sure I could do it. <clears throat> so when I read her book, I wrote back to her and I said, you're not ready for a copy edit. That's the last step. She really needed first to master craft, the craft of fiction writing. And then we could look at her story. Then she needed the story edit. And when you do a, a content edit with me, I do a copy edit as well of that. So that means I will comment on your punctuation, grammar, and all that. Um, I don't go back when you edit it because I pour everything I have into what I give you back, as you know, Kevin. I mean, you got, you know, everything I know um, comes into that. So it's a lot of education. Um, so this woman, she took it, she took the information really well. You know, I, I gave her references. I told her two books that she should definitely get. And she bought them and she said, I'll see you in a couple of months. So it worked out. So that was good. You know, I have high hopes for that. Go ahead. Okay. So do you have any advice for somebody that's writing their first book? Mm -hmm. um, what would you, what would you tell them? Um, write the book. Just, I always tell people, vomit it out. Just pour those words up, write the book because 
Nor, I don't know if you guys know who Nora Roberts is, but she's, you know, big in the romance industry and she speaks a lot, but she said, which is, has stuck with me for 15 years. I can fix a bad page. I can't fix a blank one. Right. So write the book. Don't worry about spelling, grammar, punctuation, story structure. Don't write, don't worry about any of that. All of that can be fixed, but write your story. And then once you write your story, then look at craft. Because if you focus too much on craft, you're going to lose the love of writing and the joy of writing. I mean, there's times when I'm writing where I'll be typing and all of a sudden it's kind of like I'm, I'm sitting over here outside of my body and I'm watching the words. And I'll never forget the first time it happened. I was at a coffee shop or something. And all of a sudden I'm looking at my hands and I'm looking at the screen and my hands are putting words on that screen. And I'm like over here going, wow, is anybody watching this? Because it was the most bizarre experience that these words were just, and it happens. There's a certain point in every book where that happens. And it always cracks me up. I was like, oh, here we go again. And here they come out. Judy, I thought I was strange because Uh I sit there in amazement when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, because I hunt and peck, and then all of a sudden I get a rhythm and my hands are doing this. It's like watching piano. I'm going, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm in the zone, whatever. And I'm following my hands, writing the story. I'm going, I have no idea what the hell he's writing, but yeah, exactly. it looked good. Yeah. I was like, I, is anybody watching this? This is cool. <laughs> I thought I was the only one. Uh-uh. Nope. Judy, I, I'm going to tell you who broke me in for you and prepared me for you. Uh, screenwriter uh, Richard Legrevenis of Fisher King, Pretty Woman, Bridges of Madison County. Ah. He, he was uh, uh, a client of mine, and I had told him I had written a screenplay. And which was Sprinkles. Uh, Sprinkles mm-hmm. first came out as a screenplay. And I submitted it to him and he read it in a weekend. He came back the following Monday and he told me, I know this interview is not about me. That's so okay. I'm short. He, he, uh, I was afraid to ask him because it's the first person I've ever shown any of my work writing to. No one has ever seen it. Richard LeGrevin is big times Hollywood screenwriter, right. read my first work. And he says, well, you want to know what I thought about um, your uh, screenplay? And um, I paused for a little bit and I said, yep. He goes, it was the worst screenplay I've ever uh, read. And I said, thank you. Let's go ahead and do your next set. He goes, hold on, hold on, wait. He says, you possess a talent that Hollywood pays millions of dollars for. He says, you can tell a story like no other person. Mm -hmm. And he says, I can always hire someone to write a form of screenplay. screenplay. He says, but I can't find people that will write an original story. And he says, you do it better than people that are making a living. And he just told me to keep writing. And he said the same thing. He says, says, it's a word dump. Your first draft is just a word dump. Get it out on paper. And um, and he says, stay with it. You can write a story. And um, as you know, I I just sent you another manuscript. And it's like every writer, I don't know if they're like me, they're a little insecure. You know you have something, you you send it over and I, I'm very passive aggressive. I'm going, Judy, you think this is any good? I think this is any good? Yeah, no, you always say that to me. I can't answer that. This is your no, book. But you have answered it. You just said, look, you've got a theme born, going yeah. here. You know, put it out there. Mm-hmm. And so that was enough for me to continue to, um, to, to, to write. Mm-hmm. Um, so not only did you edit dating with the full deck i have to give you credit um um jordan uh lowes was the photographer for the cover of mm-hmm. the book i'm using that as my background the, the cover of dating with the full deck but um you made it beautiful um from the you feel gave me pictures um yeah but you made it beautiful even the feel of the book when you when you hold the book in your hand the book even feels sexy um, I can't take credit for any of it. This is all Judy's uh, work. Um, I want to know, I haven't asked you this. What do you think about the finished product? I love it. I got the hardback too. Yeah. I love it. I, you know, I, I can't take every book that I work on to um, trade shows, but this one goes with me. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wasn't yeah, I'm, I'm, I think it came out really well. Um, you know, a lot of times when I do cover design, also I'm constrained by what the author's view is, which is fine. Um, you know, I want direction, but you know, I'm not the final say, so I kind of have to go with what they want. And you pretty much gave me 
carte blanche and said, come up with something. And that's, you know, I, especially since I'd read it, I don't always read all the books that I do covers for, <clears throat> but, um, you know, and then I saw those pictures. So it, it pretty much came together. I had the, the font layout and the cards, like that was already in my head and I wasn't quite sure. And that arch picture for the front cover was perfect. Yeah, I got, you know? I, I got very lucky because originally it was supposed to be a cover that was gonna have um, superimposed all the fit, uh, faces uh, with white roses and I was gonna be the only one in, in cover uh, color. It was supposed to be a thorn amongst ro roses and the people didn't show up. Those are all my friends that showed up for it and, um, and we had to punt. And I, I went back out, I framed in the picture, I talked to the photographer, which Jordan was amazing. Anyone yeah. looking for a photographer, Jordan Lowe, reach out to me. I'll give you his information, share, give him some love right, right now. But um, I, I will tell you, Judy, when you sent me um, the, the cover of my book, I cried. Good. Good. It, 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 it blew me away. Yeah. You know, there, there are those moments where you know you hit it. Yeah. And that was definitely one of them. Yeah. So it was I, a you know, combination of elements. I mean, we have to have the font, we have to have the layout, we have to have the title. I mean, the title is an excellent title. Um, and then those pictures are gorgeous. So yeah. it did, it just came together. All right. Well, I, I want to circle back because I, I know people mm -hmm. are, there, there's a big conversation out, out there. It's a war against um, ind independent authors and then traditional. Mm -hmm. Everyone's saying that if you don't go with the traditional. No, um, you're not a real author. You're not a real author, right. but independent. What's the truth, Judy? Okay. So here's the lowdown. Um, about nine years ago, there was a bloody Tuesday in December where a lot of people got let go from traditional publishing houses. And I mean, shockwaves through the industry because nobody knew it was coming. Um, I mean, there were some people who were foreseeing it because of Kindle and people say Kindle killed traditional publishing. But um, I'm going to tell you that traditional publishing is an old school model. Traditional publishing is basically consignment sales. Bookstores um, order, you know, there's a sales rep who goes around and talks to the different bookstores or the different national buyers as Sue was at Borders mm -hmm. and pitches the top books that the publishers think are going to do well. And then, you know, your local Barnes and Noble will order 15 copies of the book and they'll sell 12 and they return the other three and the author pays for that because we get an advance from traditional publishing and that advance is against sales. Now you don't typically have to pay the advance back if it doesn't, if you don't sell out, but you don't start earning royalties until you earn out that advance. <clears throat> and then there's something in the contract called reserves against returns. So say just for kicks and giggles, they give you $5,000 advance. They'll pay you half on acquisition They'll pay you um, a quarter at publication, or wait, half at acquisition, a quarter at acceptance of the manuscript after it's been edited, and then a quarter when it's published. Okay, well, you have no control over those last two dates. So you have no idea when you're getting that money. But out of that $5,000, let's say you have to pay, you know, 15% to your agent. So you get that money out and I'm not doing the math, but then they're going to hold a portion back, say a thousand dollars against returns so that you won't see that money for whatever period of time it's specified in your contract. They might hold on to that reserve for four years after publication to see how many books are going to come back. So Traditional publishing is great in that you get an advance. Advances have gone down hugely, except for big authors. <clears throat> and marketing budgets have gone down, except for big authors. So authors who are, get a contract with a traditional publisher, number one, your publishing timeline is extremely long. They're usually two years out. And, and I am traditionally published with Sourcebooks and then with um, Berkeley 
Penguin Random House. So they're now all under one umbrella. So I have six books traditionally published. I also have uh, 20 books indie published. Um, I got my bulk of my money up front for my traditional books and I've earned out, but I make way more money now in the long term with indie publishing. And I took the rights back to those first six books. There's a time in your contract where when it, you either fall below a certain threshold or a certain amount of time, whatever you, you know, negotiate in your contract, that you can get those rights back. And I took those rights back and I put the books out myself. I recovered them. I reimagined them. And, uh, you know, they're still earning me money. So it's, it used to be you couldn't sell books if you're not traditionally published. But Kindle changed all that. And I know a lot of romance authors, big name romance authors, who have left traditional publishing. They've walked away from six-figure contracts because their readership is loyal to them, not to the publishing house. And they are making Boku bucks self-publishing. Now, when you self-publish, you are responsible for paying the editor, finding a cover artist and paying that cover art um, marketing and, you know, setting up book tours and all that. You are, as the self-publisher, you are the publisher. But on the flip side of that, as the publisher, you get all the money. So for instance, a traditional contract on a mass market paperback was 6% of cover price. So in a $7 book, you were making 42 cents. That takes a lot of books to sell to earn out that $5,000 advance. Right. If you're going to self-publish and you are charging $8, $7 for a book on Amazon for, for a digital book, you're going to make 70% of that. So that's $4.90 a book. That you're going to recoup your costs a lot sooner than you're going to earn out a traditional. That $5,000 is going to come quicker um, indie-wise. So, you know, yes, the dream is for many people to have a traditional publishing contract. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I mean, I, I'm going into another genre and chopping mine around. Um, but that's, I like to keep a foot in both worlds, but right. my romances are earning me too much money to give them to somebody else. I understand that 50 Shades of Grey was started as an indie and a traditional publisher paid yes. them a lot of money. A lot of money. Well, she, because she started on Wattpad where she was giving the story away. She got a lot of buzz. Oh, yeah. James and uh, and that buzz got her noticed by the traditional publishers and yeah they paid her a lot of money for it so um, more power to her so so to our to our listeners um, that have pen in hand and you want to know how to write a book every book starts off the same way first sentence and last sentence you just got to put your pen to paper or yeah. hit that keystroke um, so Ife yes. Anything that you, you you want to know before? I'm 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 almost I'm over here like a student in class for the first time. <laughs> um, I'm just over here smiling, taking taking notes. Um, I think one of the biggest things I I want to ask is what determine well what are some characteristics um someone should look for if they want to be a writer or if they're looking to, to be an, an editor like, like you, like I know it's stuff like attention to detail, of course, being a good writer, but what are, what are some characteristics that someone should look for if they're really looking to dive deep into this, into this industry? Um, learn the industry. The, the mores of the industry are always changing. And I'm going to pull romance just because that's my you know, genre. But if you remember back in the 80s when Fabio was on the covers and it was what they always called the heaving bosoms, you know, we don't do that anymore. Those are not covers that people want to see. And for a while in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, when my books were coming out, it was the man chest. And now that's changed. Yeah, exactly. That. I, I've been on a couple, couple of those covers. There you go. There you go. And uh, I'll cover up. I look good. Hey, he looks good and he made some money. So, hey, um, and he didn't hurt anybody and, you know, whatever, consenting adults, whatever. So, um, you know, but now now I just recovered a bunch of my books. Now I'm doing kind of like cartoon characters. So you have to, you know, know 
the industry. You have to stay current in the industry. Um, if you're going to be an editor, you know, that really comes from reading if, and in writing. If you're going to be a writer, you have to read. And, you know, I was one of those kids who was under the covers at, you know, two in the morning with the flashlight. My mom would come in, turn off the light. I'm like, okay, I just need to finish this next chapter. And I'd finish the whole book and be up till 4 a.m. Um, and, you know, I still like to do that. If, they, if I'm in a book, I'll, I'll read it. And I will be voracious um, when I find something that I like. So those are the, you really, you want to be in the industry and you want to read because that's going to give you the ability to see what's, what writing should be and what it shouldn't be. I always tell people when, back when um, Romance Writers was in its heyday, because there's been some issues since, but in its heyday, there were a lot of writing contests. And I learned so much from judging writing contests, not just entering, but, you know, of course, first I entered until and then when I started finaling and then I started winning, then I felt like, OK, now I know enough that I can judge. And so I started judging and I still learned a lot. And uh, and that's where the bloody Judy came in, because everybody could always tell who who judged their manuscript because I'd be writing all over it. Um, but, you know, it wasn't like I took any kind of classes. I mean, language is a thing with me. My degree is in is in Spanish and whatever. But. Um, but understanding the industry and understanding how to construct a story. Um, you know, there are a lot of editors who leave the profession, like professional editors at publishing houses. I know several of them who've left and now they're writing because they learned how or saw how or, you know, whatever the creative juices were beforehand. I, how many of them started as writers and went into editors? I don't know. Um, but knowing reading a lot is, is how you learn to write, how you learn to tell stories. I think storytelling is a natural ability. Um, but I think, and, and here's my favorite, Dan Brown, The Da Vinci Code. I couldn't put that book down, but it's not the most well-written technically, but it didn't matter because he could tell a story and he sucked me into that story. Um, so I can teach people craft of writing, but I can't teach them to tell, be a storyteller. And, but we can still make a pretty good book, but it's the ones who come where the story is there and it's just tweaking that make it a lot of fun. Now, Judy, let me ask you a question because I know how you and I connected, but there are a lot of people out, out there that I'm hoping they take away from this. Don't don't take anything away from yourself if you get someone to help you write your book, ed edit your book. How do people find a good editor? Because there are a lot of people out there claiming to be editors and a lot of people getting taken advantage of. How do you yes. find someone like you? So, you know, a lot of times I say, look in books. A lot of times, especially indie published books, people will thank their editors. But that's a double-edged sword because, you know, while I can pour every single thing I know into an edit and they may take most of my suggestions. I don't, I'm not responsible for the final product and they may not take every suggestion or they may not master all of the crafts. So sometimes it's like, no, you really don't have to list me in that because I don't think it's going to be good, but it's a starting point. It's a way to find out who is in the industry and then do your research. Um, you know, if you go to my website, there are testimonials on there and there are a lot of testimonials on there and there are links to the author's websites or their books, the authors who have given me quotes. Um, go to those authors. They'll, most authors will be more than happy to share experiences. Um, and if they don't, you got to wonder why, and is it the author or is it the editor? So that can, you know, make you think and always get more than one or two. Um, reach out to the editor, ask for a, if they'll do a free sample edit. If an author, if an editor wants you to pay for a sample edit, run. They, you're not, we're not making money on people's sample edits. A sample edit should be free. It should be about three to four pages double spaced. Um, 
it's also it's to allow you to know what you're getting and to allow the editor to know what they're getting. Um, like I said, I just turned somebody down because she really wasn't ready for it. I could have taken her money and, you know, given her basically a master class in how to write fiction. But when I look at my time versus what I was going to give to her and she'd have to rewrite the book again. Uh, so I gave her some links. I said, you know, these are two really good books that will help you. And here's some here's a blog that you should go to. And um, and she went that way. Um, but definitely do your research. And look at the books that are the final product. Again, you have to look at that kind of jaded because you may not, they may not have taken what the editor said, but we hope that when they thank us in the acknowledgements that they have and that they've, you know, really liked what we've given them. Um, but anybody that, and then get a quote. Okay, here's the other thing. The first time I gave somebody a quote for $3,000 for an edit, I had a heart attack, but I looked at, so all the I. Time. I, I know and you weren't the first one um, <laughs> but I did because I was like oh my god but I had enough contacts in the industry I didn't need to pay an editor to get to because I at the time it was you know traditional publishing but anyway when I gave that to her I, I had a heart attack and she came back and she said you know this was a lot of money but I just realized what you gave me and then I realized what I gave her. I gave her my, you know, eight years of submitting manuscripts in the mail before, you know, people took electronics. So we would have to print them out and mail them. And then, you know, um, submitting them to agents, submitting them to editors, entering contests, going to workshops, going to my monthly meetings, um, taking classes online, the hours I spent in groups, um, critique groups, that was invaluable, but you always want to find somebody in a critique group who is at your level, because if you're critiquing in a group of people who don't write like, you know, as well as you do, or at your level of writing, then you're doing all the work and you're not getting much back. And not to say that that's a bad thing, but time management, you know, what are you looking to get out of a critique group? Um, where was I going with that? <laughs> no, I Oh, so when I gave her that, so when I gave her that invoice and she came back and she was like, you know, I really got a bargain. And I said, you know, you did. You really did. Cause you've got everything. It took me years to learn in one fell swoop. And, you know, when I look at my time that I put into it and I do the math, it's not a bad rate. I mean, it's not a bad rate for the for the writer and it's not a bad it's a livable rate for me you know who wouldn't like to make more money but it's something that i can feel comfortable with knowing what i provide um and you know you do get what you pay for i've seen other authors who charge a lot less and i said to them how much time are you putting in and they're putting in the same amount of time as i am and i was like what is your knowledge worth and they're like well they're not going to pay it and i was like Look, when you're, you know, you don't ask a doctor to go to cheap medical school. You know, I don't want him handling a scalpel on my abdomen. So yeah, this isn't life or death, but it is an industry and there are industry standards. And, you know, if people start writing crap, people are going to stop reading. Right. You're correct. And, and I, I, I'm going to say you are worth it. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And believe it or not, I didn't flinch when you when you gave it, um, gave me your, your quote. It didn't hurt when I I, I, I paid you, um, and you you exceeded. I, I would have paid double for for the end. Oh, product. that's good to know. Note to self. No. no. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're gonna edit that part out. You're right? No, you're not. You're gonna leave that in there. Um, you know, um, I, it's funny. I was just thinking. I have one client who I edited three of her books two years ago, and she you know, put them out there on the series and she entered them into a contest into the you know category they were in. And there were three finalists in the category, all three of her books finaled in the category. So she won. And so oh. now we're working on book four. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm going to tell you, you, you shepherd me. Um, like I was family. Um, you popped me upside the head to get my attention. Like <laughs> I, like I was family. Um, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Hey, I'm to holding your baby in my hands. You know, that's family. No, and, and you created a, a, a great product. I mean, I still look at the book and go, damn, that was good. That's good. And really? it's, 
it's we. We wrote, by far, I'm going to tell you, we together, this is one, and I've written some other books, Indispensable Games of X's and O's, great book, my memoirs. Sprinkles is a wonderful book, should be a, a movie one, one day. But this book, Dating with the Full Deck, took my 40 years of experience of studying human behavior and my humor, which you got, mm -hmm. and your expertise to craft a book that is so freaking smart. It separates itself from every other book in that genre. It is different. Yep, yeah, it because is. Because the one thing I didn't do in there, and you, you helped me, I made sure that I didn't blow smoke up your butt and called it a campfire. <laughs> <laughs> so no, it with, was, it's with, with, with that said um judy one more time how do people get in touch with you and are you still taking submissions um i am always taking submissions um you know my my queue of work is getting filled but uh i get it i come from an authorial standpoint on this so and i always tell people that i'm an author first um, this has grown out of my love of being an author, and I love working with authors to help their dreams come to fruition. Um, so you can get in touch with me by going to my website, formattingforyou.com, and there's a contact me button there. You can find me on social media, Judy Fennell. Um, call Kevin. <laughs> yeah, call me. I'll give you my number. Um, Ife, any last questions before um, I ask her my final question? I just had one question. How do you come upon a genre that makes sense? Because sometimes writers have, have a lot of interests and yep. they're not sure how to get into the writing game. So how would you tell an up and coming writer what genre they should pick to, um, to be able to write their most effective books? What do you like to read? What is your go-to when you're having a rotten day that you pick up to feel better? That's the one. That's cool. That was yep. a good answer. Good answer. Now, you, Judy. Well, you know why? Because you're emotionally invested in it. Like, you know that that feels good, you know, or makes, takes you out of yourself. That's what you do. You know, the best, the best things I can ever get are not great reviews on Amazon, but the letters I get from people, uh, you made me laugh while I was sitting at my dying grandfather's bedside. You know, like I did that. My silly humor made that person, took them out of their pain for a little bit. That's, that's gold to me. No. Judy, I just want to let you know, dinner for you and your fiance is on me. We're, we're going to get, get together. Yeah, yeah, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, she's a good looking lady. She is engaged. Mm -hmm. So for, for those of you that are watching this, that were trying to say that I'm going to get those digits and give her a call. Someone <laughs> already got her. Yeah. But I always ask this of every, not every one of my guests, the dessert, um, the ones that I, I think that really are going to ask for something um, special, ask. You know, God says, if you ask, you shall receive. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we, we don't market like everyone else do. We don't look for a lot of likes and whatever. We have genuine people that want to help and be part of something that follow um, RMK Productions and the 10 United podcast that subscribe and listen to Talking with Kevin and Son. Um, so I'm going to ask you your ask. If you had to have one thing that you can ask for and it will come true because there is a listener out there or a viewer that's going to watch this on YouTube or Spotify or any of the places that this podcast will land. Mm -hmm. That's going to say, I'm going to make Judy's wish come true. What would your ask be? You know, when I was going through my divorce and I had started this business and I had my company that I'd worked for had gone out of business. And so I had to take a soul sucking day job. And I turned in my last book to my traditional publisher and I drove to the beach and I sat on the beach and I said to the universe, I just want my business to keep my family going. And as soon as I said that my phone dinged and I looked down and it was, Hey, I have a, a book I want to publish. It was like a brand new client. And I just looked up at the sky and I said, okay, that's all I want. I want to, I want to be able to keep doing this. There's nothing monetarily that, or, you know, thing wise. It's just when you get up every day and you love what you do, it's not a job. And the fact that I can help people 
realize their dream on one end of my business spectrum. And then on my other, write books that make people laugh when their grandfather is dying. It's really all I want. So you can buy my books and you can, you know, write books and come to me. I, that's, I just, life is too short to not enjoy what you're doing. That is well said, Judy. Judy for now. Thank you. <laughs> uh, no, I, I know I do that all the time. So that's the reason mm -hmm. why if you don't, if you don't subscribe and listen to my podcast. You come up on a guest as a guest, you get this question and you mm -hmm. sit there and go, I wish you'd have told me before, whatever, but yep. You know, my people that I bring on are people you should know. And that's the reason why our, our audience are the people that will never get the recognition on national television, like Good Morning America and those TV shows, whatever. But on this platform, we're happy to know you. And I appreciate you well beyond words to my, my listeners. I hope you've learned um, a, a little bit. Now you know the magic behind the words. So it's just not about me the author it is just not about the words that are on our page but there there's a whole bunch of love that's going in into every word that our author writes there's a lot of pain that goes into uh write, writing a, a book and then there's a lot of luck when we push push it out in the world that hopefully that we have more fans than we have critics so i i want to say to everyone that has tuned into um talking with Kevin and son. I want to thank my co-host Ife for joining um, with me today. We appreciate all of our listeners and our friends. And I hope you enjoyed this episode. And Judy, you are definitely a person we should know. If you like what you've heard, I ask you to share. I ask you to go to RMK Productions and Network on our YouTube page and subscribe and follow. You'll get a notification. Um, I'm, again, I hope you can hear me loud and clear because I'm loving the aftershocks, the uh, wireless bone conduct conductor uh, headsets I've been using over my $300 Rode mic. No offense to Rode, uh, other than the, uh, the fact that these are comfortable. Um, I barely know that I have them on. And for those of you that um, don't understand the, the science behind um, the bone connectivity with that, just listen, I'm 63 years of age. When your hearing goes out because you've got those, um, earbuds in your ear, you'll know why I'm wearing the uh, aftershocks. So with that said, my grandfather always said, when you get to a position or a point in your life that you can help someone else, it is your duty to do so. And hopefully uh, the story of Judy and the magic beyond the words has helped a young writer um, put pen to paper and hopefully they'll connect with Judy and um, we'll see their book uh, either in, in one of the bookstores or on amazon.com. And please write us and tell us, you know, how you feel about this. And I want to thank you and thank you and thank you and thank you. So my grandfather always says, reach one, teach one. And now we're fade to black and we're out.